Good morning, everyone. We have three Bible readings today. Uh, the first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, to chapter 53, verse 12. And you'll find these um, inside your service sheet, um, or if you need a Bible, just um, put your hand up and we can bring you one. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet, who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The second reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 15, verses 33 to 38. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, 
they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Our third reading comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. When they hurled the insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I'll adjust. That should be better. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. My name's Alex. I'm the Senior Associate Minister here of the Carlton Campus. And uh, as Nat mentioned, we're starting a series on the cross. And we'll look at different aspects of the cross over the next five weeks, and we're looking at a particular aspect this morning, uh, substitutionary, uh, the, the substitution aspect of the cross or penal substitutionary atonement. We'll come to that a bit later. Uh, please, uh, uh, it'd be great if you had your uh, little news sheet with you. Uh, open it up, you've got your uh, readings there, but you've also got an outline, and that might be helpful for you uh, as you follow along, and you can uh, please do uh, take some notes if you'll find that helpful. Well, most religions and ideologies, they have their kind of concrete uh, symbols. They represent things that are significant to their history or to their identity. Uh, Islam has the crescent moon. Uh, Judaism has the star or the shield of David. Uh, Marxism has the hammer and the sickle that represent the uh, union of workers and peasants, kind of the proletariat. And Christianity has the cross. And that's really surprising. We're very familiar with it, but it's really surprising given what the cross actually represents. Our crucifixion was a punishment that was reserved for the worst criminals. It was torture. It was a death not only of cruelty, but also of humiliation and shame. Uh, even for the Jews, the cross was repugnant. It was awful. They equated crucifixion with being under God's curse. This is from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 21, verse 23. For anyone hung on a pole or a tree or a cross is under God's curse. The idea that God's king, the savior of the world, ending his life on the cross was a stupid idea. That's why people made fun of people who worshiped Jesus. Uh, you might have seen this before. This is some ancient graffiti about, coming from about the second or third century. Uh, and it's written in Greek there, and it says, uh, Alexamenos worships his God. That's the writing, and it's got a picture of Alexamenos worshipping uh, his saviour on the cross with a donkey's head. So early worshippers of Jesus were ridiculed for worshipping a crucified king and saviour. So why, in God's name, did Christians adopt the cross as their defining symbol. Well, because the cross was central to the apostolic preaching and teaching of the gospel. Uh, one example from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
This is from the Apostle Paul. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He talks at length about the centrality of the cross and what it means. And the reason that the cross was so central for Paul was because it was so central to Jesus. His own understanding of what he came to do. You see, the cross wasn't an accident, it wasn't an unfortunate ending, it wasn't some kind of dystopian plot twist which is so popular these days. It was prophesied throughout the Old Testament scriptures and it actually shapes the whole gospel story. Uh, In John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus that he must be lifted up on the cross for the salvation of the world. Uh, In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus resolutely sets his face towards Jerusalem, knowing exactly what awaited him there. And as he approaches Jerusalem, he tells his disciples several times that his reign won't begin seated on a throne, but by hanging on a cross. However, though the cross was predicted, it wasn't inevitable. It was still Jesus' deliberate choice. That's why uh, Jesus refuses uh, to appeal to the angels for rescue. He could have, but he didn't, because he was determined to do what was written. And so John Stott writes this, although he, that's Jesus, knew he must die, it was not because he was the helpless victim of evil forces arrayed against him or of any inflexible fate decreed for him, but because he freely embraced the purpose of the Father for the salvation of sinners. The cross is central. Well, to fully understand why the cross is so central and so important to Christian faith, we need to understand why Jesus went to the cross. What was he trying to do? What did it achieve? And to understand that, first we need to understand the problem of sin. Uh, This is from Matthew 22, verse 37. Uh, Jesus here is summing up God's uh, purposes for humanity in two very straightforward commands. I love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Very simple. And it's just wonderful. Imagine a world where people did these, kept these commandments all the time. Imagine a world where everybody loved each other and loved God. No people starving or begging for food. No children killed by missiles. No people in boats seeking or being denied asylum. No family violence refuges. No need for armies or police. No even need for locks on your doors. Sin at its heart is a breaking of God's fundamental and good commandments. And it's a reason why suffering exists. Our sin began with Adam and Eve in the garden and has been part of every culture and the life of every human being, except one, since. And because of sin, God says he will judge each one of us. And that judgment, the Bible says, is death. This is from Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin, the outcome, what it's earned, is death. The wages of sin is death. Uh, that judgment means physical death now, and it also means spiritual death in eternity. Uh, forever separated from God's blessing. Forever under his judgment in hell. That's the wages of sin. Often, as you can imagine, this doesn't sit well with us, with people, with our culture. How could a God who judges like this be good or loving? Maybe you've heard something like that before. Well, I'd say two things in response. First, I would suggest someone who thinks that hasn't fully grasped the majesty of God. He's the one true creator and Lord of all. He's completely holy and good 
and righteous and deserves all our obedience and worship. And so in light of who God is, sin is absolutely horrific. Second, I would say someone who thinks that God isn't loving because he judges sin, they haven't really understood how bad sin is and the consequences of not judging it. Just have a think what sin does. It ruins the world. It ruins people. We see it in our news and we have our own personal experiences of that, I'm sure. God should be angry at sin, right? But when faced with sin, God can't just be upset or angry. He must act. He must stop it. You see, if he doesn't do anything, that's effectively like saying, sin doesn't matter. It's like he's saying, those awful things people did, that's no big deal. I'm not doing anything about it. And doing nothing about sin is also implicit permission for it. If God doesn't punish him, he's effectively saying to perpetrators, you can keep going because I'm not going to do anything. It's what happens with parents, right? Tell your kids not to do that, and if you don't then follow through, they're going to keep doing it because they know nothing's going to happen. Anger without action is just virtue signalling. And because we're all sinners and we all keep on sinning, the only way that sin ends is with death. That's the only way we'll get to a new creation without any suffering or evil by excluding it and its source forever. Without God's judgment on sin, there are no boundaries on evil and it's with us forever. That's the consequence of not judging sin. So punishing sin doesn't actually make God not good or unloving. Actually the opposite if true. If God doesn't punish sin, he is neither good nor loving. So God's judgment is good. But that's bad news for us. Because we're all victims of sin and we rightly desire justice. That's a good desire but we're also perpetrators. Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're the source of violence and corruption. We're the ones who see others in need and cross to the opposite side of the road. And so God's judgment on sin, which is good, also means God's judgment on us. Sometimes people ask the question, why doesn't God save everyone? That's not the real problem. The real problem is, how can God save anyone? Well, he can save us because of his love. He loves us in in ways that we will never fully comprehend. He's determined that sin would not have the last word, that death wouldn't be the full stop. And so out of his great love, God gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to save the world through his death on the cross. Whatever we say about the cross, it's always first about God's love. Now, like a fine cut diamond, there are many glittering facets to what the cross achieved. Jesus' victory over evil and sin, cosmic restoration, healing, forgiveness, freedom, loving service. And over the next four weeks, we're going to explore some of those. However, I think the scriptures teach the fundamental way to understand the cross is Jesus' work to save people from the punishment that's due to their sin. It's fundamental, and it's a thread that ties all the other ways of understanding the cross together. That's why we're doing it first. Now, that way of describing uh, what the cross achieved has a name, uh, penal substitutionary atonement, and that's a bit of a kind of a mouthful 
probably not something you're gonna drop in conversation this week. Ah, here's one definition. Uh, at the cross, God gave himself in the person of his son to, stu- to suffer instead of us the death, punishment, and curse due to fallen humanity as a penalty for sin. Because it is a bit of a mouthful, I'll put it there in your outline as well so you don't have to try and remember it all. So firstly, uh, Jesus' death is penal. Uh, penal just means involving punishment. Jesus' death was penal because on the cross, Jesus suffered the curse, the punishment, or the penalty for sin, which was death. Our uh, second, Jesus' death was substitutionary. Uh, Jesus died as our substitute. Jesus was completely sinless. He was innocent, like in the, uh, in the temple in Israel, he was like that unblemished, spotless lamb. And like the lamb, Jesus dies instead of us in our place as our substitute. Uh, Jesus is our substitute, but he's also our representative. The same way that uh, Adam's sin uh, was representative for all humanity, Jesus' death was representative. It's like, imagine a UN, uh, sorry, a UN ambassador from Australia going there representing us, the decisions they make uh, represents us Jesus represents all humanity on the cross. That means he dies not just for one person, like a lamb was slain for one person, he dies for all. Jesus' death was penal substitutionary and Jesus' death was atoning. Because Christ paid the penalty for sin, there is, as Romans 8 verse one says, no condemnation for those in Christ. Jesus made amends for, he atoned for our sins and he makes forgiveness possible. Well, this is where this little uh, table comes in. Now you've been kind of going, what's under there? Well, some of you might have seen this uh, illustration before, but hopefully it'll help us kind of anchor. Imagine this is us. You can tell it's us because it's got a little label on it. And this is sin. Pour that in. And as you can see, it kind of pollutes us and it means that we're guilty before God. And Jesus comes along and acts as our substitute. And so... He stands in our place. And through him, our sin, the judgment due to us is poured on him. Hopefully there's enough for it here. And he washes our sins clean. So we're innocent before him. Now we're in Jesus, that's why it's Jesus, it's Jesus and us, just on the end there. So in a nutshell, that's what we, t- what we teach when we uh, teach penal substitutionary atonement. Now kind of that's the theory. Is it true? And what we're going to look at now is we're going to do a, a, a kind of a, a quick skate through the biblical story. It's woven throughout the biblical story, but we're going to focus on one part, the Gospels. So it begins in the garden uh, where uh, God curses humanity for their sin, but even then he promises a deliverer. It continues through the Passover, and we'll have a look at that later. It's at the centre of... Uh, uh, of Israel's sacrificial system. You might have heard of the Day of Atonement, which we read about in Leviticus 16. One of the key things that God communicated to his people through the sacrificial system was that people were indeed sinful, that the penalty for sin was death. But in his mercy, he provided a way back into relationship with him. He provided animals, substitutes to be sacrificed in the place of his people. That's what they were learning when they were doing Uh, performing the sacrifices. Of course, this way of understanding the cross is central to Isaiah 53, which we heard read before, a passage that's so crucial to Jesus' identity. 
Now, there's a chance to go deeper into some of those passages uh, in our uh, Connect groups, which, is, uh, which there are studies for these during the week, so please do look at some of those passages a bit more. But as I said, I want to focus today on the Gospels and Jesus' own words about the cross and the events surrounding it. And we're going to start in the upper room. Uh, Jesus spent his last evening with his apostles eating the Passover meal uh, in the upper room of a friend's house. Uh, That meal was held annually by the Jews uh, to commemorate and remember the events of the Exodus, but particularly the Passover. Uh, Many will know the story. Uh, Israel's were slaves in Egypt. Uh, God uh, sent a a series of plagues to try and persuade uh, Pharaoh to let uh, his people go. Uh, Pharaoh ignored the first nine, and so God sent a tenth and the most terrible, a plague to kill every firstborn. God warned, that Israel, uh, God warned Israel that his terrible judgment was coming. So he told them to slaughter an unblemished lamb, uh, to eat it and paint its blood on the doorposts. The plague then would pass over and the firstborn in the house was spared. And so on that first Passover night, the firstborn of the faithful Israelites were spared and they were set free. Israel was set free. God's judgment was turned away Israel was saved by the blood of the Passover lamb, a lamb substituted for them, sacrificed in their place. That's what they're remembering as they get together to share this Passover meal. Well, that night in the upper room, Jesus teaches his disciples that that Passover is about to be fulfilled in him. From Matthew 26, verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, he gave it to his disciples and he said, He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. You see, we throughout the Passover were set rituals and a fixed liturgy. But here, Jesus changes the words. He says, Now, that Passover isn't about what happened in Egypt, now it's about me my body given for you at the cross. Notice the lamb doesn't rate a mention here. It's because Jesus will be the Passover lamb. He will bear God's judgment. He will die instead of God's people. Verse 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. They're very familiar words if you've shared communion regularly. Here, though, Jesus is changing the words from the usual Passover liturgy again. After God brought his people out of Egypt, he made a covenant with them. He promised to be their God and they promised to love and obey him. But the history of Israel shows that they just didn't do it. Again and again they turned away from God and came under his judgment because of it. But God didn't stay still. Through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31 he promised to make a new covenant with his people. The days are coming declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That day's coming. The center of this new covenant was the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus is taking up this cup and he's saying, in effect, this promised new covenant back in Jeremiah, that's about to be established. The sacrifice to seal this covenant, the blood shed for the forgiveness of sins, that's going to happen in me tomorrow. And this covenant was better. It was not sealed with the blood of animals, which could never really forgive sins. It was sealed with the blood of Jesus. And it was not just for Israel, but all who would call on the name of the Lord. Well, that night in the upper room, it's clear from what Jesus is saying that his death is penal. He dies under God's judgment for sin. And he dies instead of God's people, 
as our substitute, his body given for us as our Passover lamb. And his death is atoning. Through his death, we have forgiveness of sins. That's the upper room. They finish the Passover meal and they go to the Mount of Olives, which is just east of Jerusalem. And there's an olive, olive grove there. And with uh, him are his closest companions. He leaves the, most of the apostles behind him, proceeds into the grove with Peter, John, and James. Uh, when they're there, Jesus becomes visibly agitated, quite distressed. And he says to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And then he moves further into the garden. He falls to the ground and he prays to his father. He prays that this hour of darkness and dread may pass from him. He prays, Abba, Father, everything is possible for, for, for you. Take this cup from me. Uh, Jesus has spoken about this cup before to his disciples. When Jesus was speaking about the cup, he had in mind the Psalms and the Old Testament prophets, which mention the cup. From Psalm 75, it is God who judges. In the hand of the Lord is a cup. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth, they drink it to its very dregs, the cup of God's judgment. The cup is a symbol of bearing God's wrath against sin. And that's exactly what Jesus will bear in all its horrific entirety at the cross. Have you ever wondered whether Jesus truly understands our suffering? Well, Jesus has been to the darkest places. Our tears are his. And so he prays, prostrate, sweat, pouring like drops of blood, falling to the ground. He prays that he would not be handed over to this wrath, that he would not have to bear the sin of the world. Abba, Father, please take this cup away. Abba, Father, please find another way. And what's the answer? It's silence. It's silence. Because there is no other way for the price to be paid. There is no other way for sins to be forgiven. So now Jesus has a choice. What will he do? Jesus he knows exactly what he's facing and the choice before him is real. Friends, let's be clear. This is not pretend. What will he choose? Yet not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus will drink the cup. He will bear the sins of the world. Was Jesus' prayer denied? At one level, yes. But at a deep level, no. Because at the heart of his prayer was not take this cup away. At the heart of his prayer was yet not what I will, but what you will. We can pray to God for anything, and he really does want us to. But above all, prayer is not about getting what we want. It's about trust. Trust in the Lord of all creation. Trust that he will work for our ultimate good even when we can't see it or understand it 
or perhaps even wanted. Prayer is not about controlling my circumstances, but about handing them over to God, trusting him for the outcome, whatever that may be, and however hard that is. And sometimes it will be incredibly hard. Not my will, but yours be done. And God willed that his son would die for the sins of the world. And ultimately, that's what Jesus wanted too. In this, the Father and the Son are one. Sometimes people misunderstand uh, the relationship between the Son and the Father here at the cross, and so they have a problem. They see a God as a vengeful Father punishing the helpless and innocent Son. If that's what the cross is, that's a big problem. But that's not how it is. Jesus is not a helpless child. Indeed, he's not just a man. He's God the Son, God himself. And as God the Son, he took the penalty due our sin on himself. And that's what we do when we forgive. We let the offender off. We bear the consequences on ourselves. And that's what God did at the cross. And when you understand who Jesus really is, God the Son, when you understand God as Trinity, you see that cross was not something that the Father did to Jesus. You see it as something that God did for us. That's why the Apostle Paul writes, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Out of love, Jesus chose the cross and out of love, the Father willed it. And we'll never comprehend how hard it was for God the Father to stay silent that day. But that's what he did. Out of his great love for us, he did not spare his own son. And so we come to Friday. Jesus, completely innocent, has been arrested. The crowd shout for the murderer Barabbas to be released. And he is. And so the innocent is exchanged for the guilty. Jesus is substituted for Barabbas. And he's condemned to death. And the rulers sneer at him while he's on the cross. He saved others, but he can't save himself. The words are a cruel irony. They're spat as an insult, but they're actually the truth. He can't save himself and others at the same time. So he chose to sacrifice himself to save the world. And darkness comes over the land. And this physical darkness represents a spiritual darkness that's enveloping Jesus. And what's happening in that darkness is described a number of ways throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. He's, Jesus is being crushed, punished. He's under God's curse. He's giving his life as a ransom. He's taking away the sins of the world. He's enduring hell for us. And from that darkness, Jesus cries, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, verse one. And he says it is because to be forsaken means to, be, to suffer under God's wrath. Jesus is expressing the horror of what's happening here by quoting the only scripture that could express it. And finally then, Jesus says, it is finished. He gives up his spirit and breathes his last. Well, what's finished? Jesus has endured the full judgment of God against sin. He's secured complete forgiveness by his blood. He's paid for the sins of the world fully, finally, forever. 
Brothers and sisters, without God's judgment, there is no justice and there is no end to evil. But the cross is God's no to sin. But it's a no that he takes onto himself so he can say yes to us. At the cross we see God's justice, his holiness, but also his love and his mercy meet. Friends, the cross is a glittering diamond with many facets and we've looked at one today and we'll explore more over the next few weeks. But I want to finish with just one implication. Assurance. Have you ever struggled to know God's love? To believe not just that God loves people, but that he loves you. Have you ever struggled to know not just that Christ paid for sin, but that he paid for your sin? Every single one of them. Have you ever struggled to know not just that Jesus forgives people, but that he forgives you? If that is you, please know you're not alone. And if that's you, please also know this. God knows all of us completely. Not just the presentable parts, the parts we post on social media, the parts we let out in public. He knows all our flaws and our failures, all our secret thoughts and desires. He knows every deep recess of our heart. He knows all of that and he still went to the cross. There is no deed that Christ hasn't paid for. There is no sin that he won't forgive. There is no person he won't love. And that's the proof, right? That's the proof. Our emotions are fickle. Our feelings about our relationship with God will go up and down. But the cross is the proof of his forever love for you. Let's pray. Loving Father God, thank you for the cross. Jesus, thank you for the cross. Spirit, thank you for the cross. Amen.